Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. You might think January would be a time when farmers who graze their animals can put their feet up and relax a bit. Not so fast. Winter is the best time for grazers and grass farmers to think, review, and strategize. And what better place than the Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference? The conference, of course, is being held virtually and will take place January 14th through the 16th. The conference may have moved from in-person to online, but grazers are used to moving from one place to another, be it for fresh forage or to find new ideas. Here's Jen Colby, the Pasture Program Coordinator for UVM Extension's Center for Sustainable Agriculture. We've been thinking about different ways that we could try to keep the essence of the grazing conference because there's so much of the conference because it takes place over multiple days. People stay um, in the same location typically, so they get to hang out. They get to sort of networking is a really big part of, of the conference and that field. So we're really trying to keep that. Um, we've, we've picked a, a conference um, platform that allows for a lot of audience interaction and uh, people to be able to ask questions of one another and um, and we've brought in some really great speakers and we're going to try to make the most of making a live feel out of that in, in a in a world right now where a lot of things feel sort of pre-recorded and canned <laughs> trying to cap capture the live feel well give me some of those highlights and some of the speakers that you've got coming up so we have two uh, keynote speakers. We have one on Friday, one on Saturday. And um, on Friday, we have Nicole Masters, who is um, of Integrity Soils in New Zealand. And uh, she's a soil biologist. And we're, we're actually, we're gonna do this, a similar format for both she and the other keynote um, who will be speaking on Saturday. That's Jonathan Lundgren. He is an entomologist and um, bug guy, for those who don't know what an entomologist is, he's a bug guy and he's a great bug guy. Um, and he's done all kinds of really interesting research. He's a great presenter. And then what we're gonna do with both of these folks, because they're out there on the internet, what is gonna make a conference with them different than seeing TED Talks or videos or you know that they've already done, um, we're gonna do facilitated conversations with them. We'll make their materials available for folks ahead and after. Um, but the, the joy of joining is going to be some Vermont folks asking, sitting down with, sitting down with them, asking questions and have it be that sort of feel of being in the room with them. That's, that's at least the goal that we're trying. It sounds like there are some advantages to having the conference online. Oh, definitely. How often do you necessarily get to have somebody from New Zealand who <laughs> can be, your, be one of your keynote speakers? Um, she happens to be in the West Coast of the U.S. right now, so that's a little bit easier than it would be, but um, it's really exciting. Uh, we tried to think about who we wanted, um, and, you know, because we didn't have to fly somebody in and make sure that it was going to uh, fit with them for a multiple day session. So who could we really get that we might not have otherwise been able to get? So that's pretty exciting. And um, the folks who've been registering for the conference already, we have um, local folks who've been registering already, but we've got folks we don't know who are registering for the conference. I think that's a real advantage too, is that people from the West Coast can check us out in Vermont, see what we're doing up in the Northeast and people from outside the region who maybe wouldn't be able to leave their farm are gonna be able to, to jump in. And that's really exciting. That's really exciting. We've been thinking about who we could reach out to. What's been the impact of COVID-19 on grazing and grass farming? Oh, that actually has led to one of one, at least one of the conference sessions. Um, so, so one of the impacts, uh, I mean, just in general, I would say that, um, you know, this was a really dry year, a droughty year, and that has had a really big impact on the mechanics of grazing. Um, but for grass-based farmers, the sales of um, meat has just skyrocketed. There are folks who sold out of a whole year's worth of meat in the first few weeks of the, of the pandemic, or at least first few weeks of the spring. Um, and then there are folks who have taken on more animals and, and tried to ramp up their production, which led to some processing bottlenecks. And so that's one of our sessions at the grazing conference is actually talking about processing and how to work with your processor and how to streamline that whole system. So it seems really timely in itself. Are we going to go back to where we were uh, pre-pandemic or has has this new emphasis on marketing really changed 
how grass farming and grazing will go forward? It's such a really good question. And it's been the question that we've continued to ask ourselves. And I asked that of myself and my business has, has grown quite a bit this year too. And um, so as I talk to people, the hope is that we can use this as an opportunity to set up systems, streamline things, smooth out things, work together more so that we can both capture a good chunk of the people who we have this year right. after go back to a different, you know, another kind of a normal, whatever that normal is. Um, you know, we don't want to go back to pre-COVID levels of local food sales. We, we want to see if we can capture 20, 30, 40, 50% of those folks because they find value in what we do and what we're producing. Um, so that's the goal. We don't know what that number is, but I would definitely say that, that that's a concern because folks don't want to um, invest in a lot of infrastructure because they don't know what the future right. And that's, I mean, that's, that's all over the country and the world and yeah, Vermont. You don't want to go backwards, but you also don't want to overshoot and yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we don't want to assume that what we have right now is going to continue in perpetuity. So I think that, you know, some of the uh, hopefully optimistic people are like, so if we could capture 30%, you know, like five years from now or three years from now, could we still have 30% of what we have now? And that's something that we can we can build our businesses around. The 2021 Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference kicks off on January 14th and runs through the 16th. For details on registration and workshops, visit the website on your screen. As you heard, the conference is virtual, but there is a charge for registration. Check the website to learn more. Road salt is both a blessing and a curse. It keeps our highways, roads, and parking lots safe but it's often harmful to the environment. For the past few years, Lake Champlain Sea Grant has been educating snow removal professionals on sustainable salt use practices to protect natural resources and keep more money in town budgets. Here's Sea Grant Director Chris Stepanuck. So what we're finding in around the area, New England and beyond, is that water quality is getting contaminated with chlorides. And once chlorides are in the water, then it puts the aquatic life at risk. And at low levels of chloride, there's risks to uh, reproduction. And at higher levels of chloride, then it could actually mean death to certain aquatic organisms, or all of them, if there's enough salt in the water. I was asked to come up, we've been doing a uh a lot of work on the I-93 corridor in the southern part of the state um, relative to the expansion of the highway. And because of some chloride impaired waterways that were in that area, um, we've been required to reduce the salt usage in that area. Um, so over the course of a number of years, we've, we've managed to actually reduce our chloride uses by about 20%. Um, so today I was able to come up and explain the, the kind of the multi task way that we ended up being able to do that with the, with the technology, the equipment, and then also the training that we've put into place. Winter maintenance is, is kind of a three-legged stool, as I try to describe it. And the three legs are safety, the environment, and, and financial. You can protect the environment by saying use no salt at all. That's going to help you financially as well, but it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you on the safety aspect to it. Um, there's other deicers that you can use that aren't chloride-based, so you're not going to affect safety. You're going to help the environment, but they're really expensive. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of different ways where you can make safety really good by just using way too many chlorides, but then that's going to bust the environment and it's going to bust your budget. So it's really a matter of balancing all three of those aspects to it and just putting the right amount of material in the right place at the right time. One of the first things that we talk about is measure. If you don't measure what you're doing now, you can't improve it because you can't see what there is to improve. And then I think the other major takeaway is prevention. We, we heard prevention talked about in a lot of different terms, particularly uh, you know the, the, the method of anti-icing, the use of brine. So, this, this really is going to require an industry and industry professionals to, you know, become, become better educated, become edu educated on new techniques, become innovative, and then, you know, we have to stop resisting change in this case because change is the answer and uh, we just have to allow it to happen. 
The results have been fairly compelling so far. So, you know, on the private side, in, in all the properties that we've certified in the last season, we've seen some really interesting uh, salt reduction by sometimes as much as three times the amount that would normally be applied. And uh, from a cost standpoint, uh, in, in, in some of the best cases, 50% cost reduction in salt use. So if you want more salt, you actually raise that number. So what I hope our participants from today would be able to take with them is, first of all, knowledge of what are those best practices that we know that aren't being implemented that often, at least by private contractors and by show of hands today, maybe by municipal folks as well. Uh, and what can they do? So why are they important? How do they do it? and taking home the knowledge that they can test it out and see what it's like for themselves before they necessarily try it at the municipal level or across all their customers. Uh, so making them feel comfortable with knowing what those best practices are and that they can try them and see up for themselves what they think before they um, head out. And then also resources. What are the resources that are out there for them to be able to learn pavement temperatures, for instance, or how to do brining, uh, create brine, or how to do calibration? Uh, and then in the future, what I hope to do is work more with the groups, both the municipalities and the private contractors, and be able to help them learn the new technologies as you mentioned, there's been all kinds of new technologies from live edge plows to calibration and in truck uh, communications between what's happening behind the truck or under the truck and, and within the truck. So being able to introduce those technologies in a way that makes it useful for the communities to be able to use less salt, keep the roads safe, and have their employees well, well informed to do their jobs. And that's our program for today. Thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.